Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. This is Jeremiah, it's J-Man Monero with J-Man Speaks with J-Man's Ed Talks number 17, I think. Uh, today's topic is realtor safety because it's realtor safety month, the month of September, and we are here with our special guest, Carl Carter Jr. It's a tongue twister. <laughs> it is. Carl Carter Jr. Um, but the safety guy himself. So Carl, just, I mean, kind of let's get right into it and introduce yourself and let's get started. All right. Well, I appreciate you you having me. Um, always, always honored to talk about this topic, and um, very honored to talk about my sweet mom. And really, if if you're okay with it, I'd love her to to tell um, tell your audience uh, her her story and and the sweet lady that she was. Absolutely. So this this week, uh, just two days ago, uh, marked five years since my mom was kidnapped while showing property and later murdered and it has it has been a um, as you as you might imagine it has been a, a very tough tough situation uh, to navigate and um, I'd love to to tell you her story uh, just here in a few minutes because I really think that there's a lot that that our industry that agents can learn from my mom's story and the, and the ways that she was deceived um, you know, about five years ago, you know, my mom was a real estate agent. We we live here in um, the Little Rock, Arkansas area. And so she had, you know, and you can kind of put yourself in this, this, um, this scenario. So my mom starts hearing from a husband and a wife and they, you know, they're, you know, it sounds like a dream scenario, honestly. They're relocating to the state due to work. They're cash buyers. They really need to get in a property quickly. Um, their, their ask of a home, um, really that I later saw documented in my mom's files, um, really didn't seem like anything that would be all that hard to find. Um, they were, and they were interacting with my mom. So they reached out to her via phone calls, via text, via emails, and presented her with this story and, and sought her, her services. And, you know, it became, you know, a, a pretty, a tricky thing for the investigators later to navigate because mom was trying so hard to to be a good agent to this couple, um, and you know she had talked up, she had talked them up to to other agents in her office, you know, because inventory was low at that time, and so it it really became a, um, you know, a tough thing for investigators because they they had to interview. Uh, so many agents because of their knowledge, you know, from having conversations conversations with my mom about them. And of course, my, my poor dad, just like all of our spouses, you know, um, I'm a realtor myself and, you know, they, God love them for, for listening to all of our stories about, you know, our, our uh, good, bad and in between transactions. Um, and so, you know, as my mom interacted with them, it's, it's important to note that their phone number for their phone calls and text matched that of an out-of-state number, and which matched their stories for them, you know, moving to work uh, for work. And, you know, my mom didn't realize that that phone number meant nothing. You know, five years later, we we see kind of this natu- uh, national, you know, like nightmare of getting phone calls that the you know from these telemarketers and they're calling from local numbers and. Um, these spammers, but really back five years ago, you know, um, the, the idea of receiving a phone call from a number that, that was being misrepresented was, was new. And, you know, similarly, like she, as she interacted with this couple via their email accounts, they, they had gone in and created fictitious email accounts to match the names that they were given her. So, you know, and I think it's worth noting. Um, I can't say that this applies to everyone, but I'll 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 tell on myself a little bit here. I'm bad to fall into kind of a trap of of people that I find um, you know to fit profiles of a bad guy, and people that that you know threaten you know that I feel threatened around and by. And I must admit that you know if I were to you know sit down and try to profile what a bad guy looks like. Um, it certainly wouldn't be this young, attractive um, couple right. um, seeking to buy a house. And, you know, that, I think one reason why my mom's story resonates with so many people is because they're like, you know, she's working with this couple. 
which includes a female, and we don't associate violent crimes with females. And so there's just this, this, um, there's this element that, that so many of us see ourselves in because, uh, you know, we certainly don't think that women could be capable of, uh, of doing what ended up happening to my mom. I'll tell you the other side. So, you know, it's like, what, what were these bad guys trying to do? Why, why kidnap an agent? Why, why prey upon an agent? And really, it's an uncomfortable truth that every one of us in this, this industry need to face. And that is that there is a public perception that we are wildly rich, <laughs> regardless of what's in our checking account. And, um, and of course, you know, for, for predators, it is well known that we work alone. And so, you know, when asked multiple times, you know, why Beverly, they, the, bad, the husband, and I call him a bad guy, um, which sounds childish, but if I don't call him that name, I, I <laughs> jump to a much worse name. And, um, you know, he repeatedly said that Beverly was targeted. My mom was targeted because she was a rich broker that worked alone. And you might think, you know, it's a big gamble, right, to just say, to make this assumption based upon a public perception that an agent is rich. But so what they did to kind of validate that this person was the cash cow that they thought that she would be, um, they did a number of Internet searches on her. Evidence was found on the laptop of these, these bad people that they had Googled her. They had gone to her Facebook profile and clicked all around through her photographs, uh, which is an eerie thought and a reminder for all of us to, to be very judicious in what we share as it relates to our personal lives. Um, and then lastly, you know, and um, they had gone and searched property records and determined the property value of the home that my mom lived in. And, you know, through the Facebook profile and uh, property records, you know, they also identified that my mom was married and that my father would be, was their plan all along to get the money. So the plan, kidnap the rich broker, hold her for ransom, get all of this money from the husband, and uh, nothing's going to go wrong. And... Um, so as they're interacting with my mom, they, they ultimately picked, a, they picked their own house to be the first house that my mom would show them. And so the husband calls my mom and he's like, you know, this is the one. And we don't know what in that moment gave my mom pause. But we know that when he called to, to, to request that showing that she did something really great and a great safety tip for anybody watching. Um, she, in that moment, for whatever reason, felt uncomfortable and made up a company policy on the spot. And the company policy she made up was that, you know, she apologized. She said, I'm so sorry, but company policy prohibits me from showing property alone in a rural area. And a um, really smart approach. And I would encourage you that if you ever find yourself in a position where you don't necessarily feel empowered or maybe your words, you know, you feel put on the spot and you can't really collect your thoughts, um, you know, let, let the broker be the bad guy, you know, um, I'm sure your broker would get behind any anything like that that would help keep you safe. Absolutely. But you know what my mom didn't anticipate, and you know how many how many of us would, is that the husband hands the phone over to to his wife and you know she she says, Hey, you know, Beverly, this I'm actually going to be coming separately. I'll meet you guys there. Uh, I'll be coming from work. If the three of us are there, would your company be okay with that? And um it's a real turning point in the story because I think that that's where we all sit back and we say, you know, when faced with this type of decision, would we, we likely would have done the same thing. Right. Um, but it's also important to note, and this is in no way victim shaming, I can promise you my mama was my favorite person. Um, keep in mind, up to this showing, up to this point of the story, there was really, there, was, there hadn't been a face-to-face -face meeting yet. Um, the first time meeting would be at this, this property. There had been no exchange of, you know, identification, driver's license, whatever it may be. And, um, you know, who's to say? We don't know in my mom's case, but we have to believe that stripping a person that, that seeks to do bad of their anonymity uh, is a powerful tool and very likely to get them to move on. Um, but, you know, after the wife said she would be there, my mom agreed to, to meet them at this property. 
Um, my mom is actually very familiar with this property, and she knew that this was a waste of time. Uh, this this property was actually within my parents' community that they lived. Um, it lakefront property at one point was a very beautiful home, but there had been issues. You know, it was a foreclosure. There had been issues of squatters. People had gotten in there and ripped out things of value, fixtures, and even down to the copper. Um, and so she knew this. But, you know, alternatively, you might also think she might have also thought of this as, as a safe place, too, because it being her community. Three doors down from this home is where her pastor of her church lived. Um, and so, you know, setting this appointment and going into it, she, um, she did some great things. She told agents that she was going to show property that day to this couple. She called my dad and said, you know, hey, I've been at a realtor event. I won 50 bucks on a raffle today, so I'm going to go show property to this couple. And uh, then I'll pick up dinner with my winnings from this raffle, and um, I'll see you later this evening. And, you know, I just can't emphasize enough, and I know it sounds so basic, but it's like it was a Thursday, like a million Thursdays before it, you know, in, in the, the life of a realtor. And so she got off the phone with Dad and, and went to meet this couple and arrived at the property early. And, you know, we can be reminded of all the things that we need to do, you know, parking, smart where you're not blocked in and knowing that there are issues of squatters. So, you know, proceeding with caution. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the main point here with my mom, and there really there are two things. One is that, the, you know, first was the husband arrived at this property. And as he approached my mom, you know, it was noted, you know, this black car pulls in, young Caucasian male with dark hair, you know, greets her. Um, and it, I, I know maybe it's petty, small of me, but, you know, I can't help but, but almost hope that, that this bad guy is kind of haunted by, by the memory of this, this beautiful professional woman that was seeking to help, uh, was actually greeting the person that would soon thereafter kidnap her. Um, and so... As he approached my mom, he, he started in with apologies and excuses and a request. And how that went is that he was apologizing that the wife had gotten caught up at work and she wasn't going to be able to join them. And then he proceeded to, to make a very big ask of my mom. He asked her to, to proceed with showing the property. And that as they toured the property, because there were so few photographs of this property online, he asked, and my mom did know that, um, he asked that if she would take photographs and text them to the wife. And so it could be as though the wife was there with them, you know, digitally um, on this showing. And, um, you know, around that same time frame, my mom starts getting texts from the wife. And it really kind of seconds that story and it seconds the request to proceed and, you know, so sorry. And I really, we think, you know, we're interested in this house. Will you please send photos and answer any questions? And so here's the second thing from this story. So one, the importance of verifying identity of the people that we're working with. But, but next is I know just because, not just because she was my mom, but because she's human, that right now in that moment, faced with this decision, do I show this property? She had that burning feeling in her stomach that God-given instinct that was just, you know, that spidey sense that was just saying, golly, this is not what we agreed to. Uh, and so I hope that as people learn of my mom and, and, you know, it's Realtor Safety Month, like you said, like to just really just feel empowered to keep your personal safety at the forefront. But my sweet mom, you know, and at the end of the trial, um, she so she shows the property and at the end of the trial, we got back a number of things of my mom's that, that were found. And one was my mom's cell phone. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, very haunting to look at her camera roll and see that the last 10 photos or so on her camera roll were actually the last moments of her freedom. And, um, you know, knowing that as she took that last photograph, which is of the bedroom in this property, that as she turned from that, this bad guy said to her, and he's been very proud, um, 
He'd been very proud of himself to say that the last words that my mom heard in her freedom uh, was that she was about to have a very bad day. And uh, my mom was taken by surprise. My mom was, uh, my mom was kidnapped um, after being tased. And uh, this bad, bad person um, took the most ridiculous lime green duct tape, you know, like so many of our kids use for craft time. And uh, he bound her ankles together, her wrists behind her back, just kind of ridiculously around her head, over her eyes and over her mouth. And um, he then went outside that property and got in his car, turned it around and backed it up to the front of that, that house. And he opened the trunk. <laughs> And I tell you, you know, maybe this is this is a lesson not just for real estate, but for all of us as we are, you know, and I'll, I'll purpose to do this tonight, too, is as we're sitting down tonight having dinner with with our families, just to remind our families that if they see something suspicious to say something yeah. and say something in the moment, uh, because everything that I told you about the black car, the young Caucasian male with dark hair, getting out, greeting the real estate agent, and then soon thereafter coming out, moving the car around and opening the trunk. Every bit of that was witnessed um, by the next door neighbor. But that didn't come out until, you know, investigators were, or detectives were knocking doors that night, asking questions. Um, and who knows what, what might have changed, maybe nothing, but uh, so important to, to report things that we see that are suspicious. Um, you know, I, one thing I really struggle with, of course, I mean, I lost my mom, but there are just parts of it that are tough. And, uh, knowing that, that the person, you know, your first love, your mama, um, was, was, was abducted and put in the trunk of a car is very hard. Uh, it's a very hard thing. Um, but he did. He put her in the trunk of the car, and before he closed the lid on that car, he pulls out his cell phone, and he takes a picture of her in the trunk of that car, and he texts it to his wife. And, um, you know, we can only assume he did that because, you know, he was trying to show his wife that their plan to kidnap this rich realtor for ransom was in play. And he, uh, he drove off, and he, he drove my mom um, in the trunk of that car to another spot and made her do a video and that video was to be a series of videos that would be delivered to my dad demanding the ransom money. But the important thing about that, that no videos were ever transmitted to my dad. Their plan fell apart way too, way too fast. But an important part of how they would get the money was through all those cards in my mom's purse. And it's important to note that my mom didn't carry her purse while showing property that day. Many ladies don't. Um, many ladies don't because of safety and security reasons. Some don't because it's just in the way uh, while they're showing a home. Um, and then others, you know, maybe they do because, you know, they have access to a, you know, a file or, a, you know, personal protection device of some sort. And, um, you know, it, in his haste to kidnap mom and to harm her and to tape her and to put her in the trunk of that car, he forgot the most important thing aside from her, and that was her purse. It was, she didn't show property that with the purse on her shoulder, hers was locked in her car. And so from the time he drove away with her, the plan was already ruined. And um, he hadn't yet realized that and made her do the first ransom recording. And then later took my mom to their home, the bad guy's home, and locked her in their, their master bathroom. And um, it was in that moment that they realized that their plan their access to the cash to the purse wouldn't be possible. And so the the bad guy gave his wife a firearm and told him, you know, to told her to, to guard the bathroom door. They had locked my mom in their master bathroom and said, you know, guard the door. I'm going to go back and get the purse so we can get this ransom money. And um, what that bad guy didn't know was that when mom went missing, we all knew where to look. And... Um, so that night, as my dad and me and my brother and, you know, were out there and a host of detectives, you know, the, you know, the, this neighborhood, and especially the piece of property that we were there, knowing mom was abducted from, there were no utilities. It was so dark. So really the only way you could see there on that property was from all these shades of blue that were flashing. And um, as we stood out there, just 
confused and trying to replay everything we knew at the time about real estate, we knew through her and hearing about her transactions. And um, so we're going through everything that we knew about real estate and trying to develop stories or scenarios that made her okay. And, uh, you know, the later it got, the fewer excuses we could come up with. Um, and, you know, I remember seeing off in the distance, you know, headlights. And that, that car was stopped and questioned about their knowledge of the disappearance of a local real estate agent. That person denied knowing anything and left, left the scene. And none of us knew, and how could we have known, that that night that was the actual bad guy. He had come back to the scene while we were all there to get my mom's purse. And, um, you know, kind of to the point I was making earlier about the fear of getting caught um, after seeing the blue lights, it sends this panic through this, this, this bad person, then this fear of going back to prison. And so it became this wild leap from this, this you know, elaborate ransom plan to let's just, let's just get what we can from her on her person right now, and then let's just, let's just kill her. And, um, tough. Um, we soon thereafter, my dad began getting texts from my mom's phone. And so in that moment, we were actually super relieved and I'll admit I was a little embarrassed because it was like, Oh snap. Like we are hearing from mom, like girl, you got some explaining to do. We've got these cops involved. And, um, one of, so it's as a, you know, there's a couple of texts come through and we're so happy and relieved to hear from mom. And then a third text comes in and it's kind of explaining to my dad that, that she was out having drinks with friends. And, uh, if you knew my mom, you'd know that that, that, was not in character for her. So we knew in that moment um, our elation and relief turned quickly to horror because we knew that someone had her phone and they had her and they were pretending to be her. And really what he was trying to do in that moment was buy himself some more time and kind of throw everybody off, uh, which was pretty successful um, for a moment, if not any, you know, anything. Um, you know, mom was kidnapped on, on Thursday, September 25th, and um, her body wasn't found until um, going into the early morning hours of the 30th. So from the 25th to the 30th, she was missing. And, you know, it's during that time, the, the darkest days of my life, um, that the real estate industry rallied around our family. And we had hundreds of real estate agents that were searching farmland, farm fields, like just um, trying to, to find any evidence of her. And, you know, many, many more reaching out to us and offering prayers. So I always have to say I can't tell this story with, without expressing my love and gratitude to this amazing industry. Um, but, you know, what those bad guys did is, you know, they when they realized their plan wasn't going to work, they just made this huge leap and they took her jewelry and uh, even some of the articles of clothing that my mom was wearing that day, uh, which is disgusting. Um, my mom's shirt that she was wearing while showing property was found hanging in, in the closet, found uh, of the wife, found snapped in half and discarded. And I almost think there's just a lot of symbolism there. Found snapped in half and discarded under a kitchen cabinet was my mom's realtor name badge that she was showing property, you know, wearing that day. Um, and they took my mom to, to a remote area and uh, a, you know, backside of what I call a concrete plant where they store trucks and clean them after jobs. And on the backside of that private property, they, uh, they took that same, that same tape that uh, my mom had been abducted with. And uh, they used it to just completely apply it to her face until she could no longer breathe. Um, and my, my sweet, precious mom suffocated and I'll tell you you know the surveillance footage was found of them not long thereafter at a retail store purchasing a shovel and they went back and buried my mom in a shallow grave um, it was through amazing detective work that they were able to to route the correct phone number and then 
through eyewitness accounts of the description of the husband and the type of car he was driving. Um, you know, they were able to, to find these people and they were able to find my mother's body. And uh, for that, I'm very thankful. Uh, we did go to trial and uh, these bad people are in prison now. Uh, the wife will be up for parole in about 20 years from now, unfortunately. Um, the husband is serving two life sentences without the possibility of parole for uh, capital murder and, and kidnapping. Um, and I'll, t I'll tell you, you know, um, if, if I may just impart just a few takeaways from my mom's story that is just, you know, back to the importance of ev with it, everything in your power to strip people of their anonymity by verifying their identity, you know, whether that's proof of funds or, you know, you know, working with a lender or whatever it is to, you know, for, um, you know, make sure that they, they are able to purchase the home, um, you know, driver's license, um, trusting that instinct, um, because we do know that my mom had that, that, that feeling in her gut, um, that day. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's important for us to, to realize what, what doesn't, um, what doesn't validate the identity of people. And that, that is um, important with um, my mom's story that phone numbers don't validate people and email addresses don't validate people. Um, and, you know, and since losing mom, um, you know, I've, I've had the honor of sharing her story in, in hopes of keeping it from happening again. And I'll tell you, you know, at the conclusion of my, my sessions, uh, in, you know, face-to-face, -face, I'm always approached by at least one agent, and they have their story of a time that they were either victimized or a time that they just, they were in an open house or in a showing, and they felt so incredibly vulnerable. And uh, as a result, we created this, this nonprofit in my mother's name, the Beverly Carter Foundation, and um, it, it doesn't just it doesn't just seek to um, to continue a legacy for my mother. It, it truly seeks to to help keep um, every single person in this industry safe. Well, Carl, if you I can, I'm just going to bring up a picture of your dear mama. Is that okay? Oh, please, absolutely. She's much better to look at than me. <laughs> Yes. Hard to believe it's been five years. Um, but what a blessing that I, I get to share her with so many people because, you know, we've all experienced loss in our lives. But um, I mean, it's I get to share her. incredible story. And we have a couple of comments here from some of the viewers. You know, everybody's. You've done a fantastic job in, in sharing the story, and and uh, you know Tracy Hampton Bernard here. She says I was in tears the first time I heard Carl's story, but hope he knows that that many other realtors have changed the way we view our safety. Yeah. Carl will never know how many lives he may have saved. So I'm sure you hear messages like that every day, and you know with with Realtor Safety Month, I, I just want everybody to know that on we we have the website. Um, at the bottom of the screen here, it's beverlycarterfoundation.org. But if you comment realtor safety on this broadcast, uh, we have it set up so our, our messenger bot will actually send you three separate resources from the site uh, that Carl has set up. And maybe Carl can talk a little bit more about it, but um, the downloadable resources, the victim resources, and then also video training uh, to help people to be safer every day in their real estate life. Absolutely. You know, if one thing I would love to just hit on is, is that the downloadable resource section of the website is actually my favorite. Um, we've worked hard on those. And what's great about them is that there, there are a lot of different topics related to safety and, and related to different, uh, different elements, you know, different times of the transaction uh, that you can be safe. And what's cool about them is that each of them are only one page and you can pull it down, take it to a sales meeting. And it's a great way and in a very concise way to be able to um, to keep the safety conversation going within your office. So, and it's all, you know, it's all 
we're a nonprofit, so it's, it's all 100% yours, 100% accessible to everybody. Um, and we actually have a um, video library of an additional 30 videos in addition to these that will, um, that will be posted very soon. I'm going to go to the downloadable resources here. So you have, you know, this is, you guys put a lot of time and effort into and Of course, we, we always love to, to hear any tips you may have, or, you know, if you see, you know, you know, parts of the, you know, the, the real estate process that you feel are underrepresented is from a safety perspective. Uh, we, we have a, an education committee that would be, uh, would jump at the opportunity to build additional um, materials. And of course, to that point, if you want to get engaged, um, we have a number of committees that we would love, love, love to work with you on um, from, from marketing to, to education, uh, technology assessment, but all in the vein of safety. And, and certainly from a place of love, I, I hope that it, I've been able to impart um, my heart because it is not my intent to ever cause fear or paranoia in our industry that, that my mom would give me a thump on the head from, from heaven. Um, it is, it is solely, um, our intent to just raise awareness. Well, I mean, thanks again. And, and again, if, if you're watching this, don't just watch and listen, but take action, you know, cause I think that's part of what is Carl's mission to, to make a difference and hopefully, you know, hoping that his mom's story can make a difference and, you can hear this and if your broker doesn't have a plan in place, talk to your broker just because you're the agent. Does not mean you can't do something about it? You know, talk to your broker and, and, or sit down in an office meeting. Like Carl said, you have all these resources available. They've gone through a lot of time and effort to, to put them together for you. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so let's, let's all make it safer for all of us realtors every single day. Carl. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Carl. No, oh, no. And I tell you, if we're still live, um, one thing that I'll add is that um, I have the tremendous opportunity to, um, to speak at NAR annual, uh, of course, as you do as well. Um, so that's, that's great. It's, it's going to be great with, with everyone there to, uh, to spread the message of safety on that stage. And then also, if you'll so if you'll be there in November in San Francisco, we will be on the expo floor, and so we'll have safety resources uh, printed, and also have some fun giveaways, um, and just little materials. I think even down to just having you know, I know the last thing we need in this industry, you know, is another pen. Oh, and you know, actually, I have one. I promise, I didn't. Uh, this isn't a plug or planned, uh, but we'll have a number of things because even just picking up a pen and seeing, you know. Um, a little reminder about your safety, I think, can be great. So make sure you stop by and see us. Okay. Thank you, Carl.